got a message from Mr. Harris. He indicated that he wasn't able to hear me. Mr. Roberts, can you hear me okay? Yes, sir. Okay, great. Ms. Winkles, are you on the line? I am, Your Honor. Okay, great. Uh, let's go ahead and take the Agavino Willette matter now. Uh, this is on today for presentation. Uh, late yesterday, I received an email from Mr. Roberts containing uh, proposed orders. Uh, Ms. Winkles, I assume you got that at that late hour also. Um, I did. I was unable to review them because my plane was delayed. Um, oh. So I'd asked for an actual uh, one week continuance just so that I can actually review those documents. I have no problem with that. Okay. Let, let me touch base with the parties. Uh, next week, I will not be present. And the following week, I will not be present either. So we'd probably be looking at the 31st for presentation, if that's okay. That works for me. I do have one request, though, for those visitations that are going on during that time. Is there any way that we can make sure that those are rec video recorded um, just for due process for, for us getting, we're, we're having a separate investigation done. Um, in the meantime, in those three weeks, if we can just ask for Beth Fellows to, to record those, video record those and to provide them to my office. Other than that, I have no problem with the three weeks. Mr. Roberts? Um, I don't have a problem with the three weeks. I think that as long as the visitation times are agreed, which I think they are, we're good. Um, I, 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 I don't know about the, the, the being recorded. I think the video ones are recorded. If there is going to be an additional fee, I'd ask that Ms. Ulett pay for that because um, it's something that my client um, isn't requesting and the court didn't order. And I don't know if Ms. Winkle, um, uh, excuse me, Ms. Fellows is going to re request payment for that extra bit of labor. And and my as long as Mr. is is fully liable for the reunification, counseling, and therapy, my office will pay for the recording. Okay. All right. Um, so it sounds like there's there's no direct opposition to the recording of those video visits, um, and no opposition to sending it over to the 31st of October at 9 a.m. So. Mr. Mr. Roberts, did any last words? I saw you move your mouth. Forward. I mean, I, I think my, my, I haven't talked to my client. My client would probably object. I don't want to, I caught off guard. So I'm just being transparent with, with your honor. Um, sure. But I think I, I would lodge an objection for the record. I would just submit it to the court and you've heard everything else I have to say. So however you want to deal with it, I understand. Yeah, th th that makes sense. Um, you know, it's kind of an inter interesting request related to the recording of video visits. Um, I think when people know that they're being video recorded, it changes their behavior. Uh, and sometimes um, that can be good and that could be bad. Um, I believe they're for the in-person visits that we're starting. Oh, so I'm not worried. I'm not, the, the video visit is not the problem. Um, the video visit, it would like, you know, obviously the video visit should automatically be recorded depending on what program they're using. Um, and I'll be requesting those, but uh, the in-person visit, I think, is the, the one that's more of the issue. And I, and I guess my my concern, and, and I'm off the cuff here because this is an uh, unusual request, and that's not a criticism, um, is that we have a supervisor who is assessing the evaluation, hoping to rebuild the relationship. And if it has this extra element of of having to put on a show for the camera, it interferes with the human connection. That's my concern. I I don't want to speak for Ms. Fellows, but that's, anyway, uh, that's my position, Your Honor. Okay. I, I appreciate that clarification, Ms. Winkles, that, that the request was for the in-person vi visits to be videotaped. I was thinking it was the the, the, the ones that you mentioned earlier, the, the video visits. Uh, so um, I think it does change the dynamic uh, because I don't, I don't know how that would work if uh, Ms. Fellows would hire a separate person that would have their camera and kind of follow the kids around at the park or, you know, it seems mm. a bit stilted. I, I'm not sure. I think that the video, they have that capability anyway at the facility and it's only when the visits are occurring at the facility and it would be, you know, almost like big brother in the background. Um, right. It shouldn't interfere with anything because it should just be almost a security camera recording at that time. Kind only like, Mr. would know the children wouldn't obviously know what was going on. So it'd be kind of like a ring camera in the, like the corner of the room. Something exactly. Like that. Yeah. Okay. All right, no, noting the objection from Mr. Roberts, I'm, I'm fine with the in-person video visits being recorded via the kind of non-obtrusive uh, camera in the corner. So nobody, nobody's there like you know, taking pictures, but it, it, the camera can be activated. For the, for the record, um, I, my understanding is that Ms. Winkles is requesting this only until presentation, the court signs orders is, is, is only for these two visits and then going forward, supervisor will just be in charge. Is that correct? 
no, at that point we can argue, we can put a motion on. Um, that's what we would do. We would actually give our reasons and put a motion on rather. So uh, essentially just doing it until that time. And then we can argue it out and decide going forward. So it sounds like we're going to need argument on the 31st, if I'm clear, because my order is not going to include video visitation. That wasn't issue. That wasn't addressed the last hearing. Am I hearing everyone correctly? If I, if it's three right. weeks, yeah, I would be getting a motion out with a motion order a certain time. So we can do it all at the same time. Okay. Yeah. So, so the today's ruling related to the recording of in-person visits would be limited until October 31st and October 31st. Um, it would expire if an, a motion has been noted uh, to hear it on the 31st, we could take it up then or whenever it's noted for. That's great. All right. Thank you, Your Honor. All right. Any, any last items, Mr. Roberts? No. And you have the orders. Do you want me to sub submit another copy for you and mail them? Or are you okay with what you have? I'm kind of a creature of comfort. Um, if you, if you could uh, resupply them, that would be fantastic. Not a problem. That'll be that'll be done. They'll be the same form. And You'll have the hard copy. And if Tracy Joyner, if you're on the line, will you please unmute? Say good morning. So I know you're here. Good morning. I'm here. All right. Good morning, Mr. Driver. And uh, Ms. Osborne, if you're here, uh, if you could please unmute and and say good morning. Your Honor, I believe my client was intending on appearing via YouTube today. Oh, okay. Very good. Great. Thank you. All right, uh, we are on today for Ms. Driver's motion for show cause regarding contempt uh, related to uh, spousal support order from May of 2022, and also some some debt uh, debt assignment and payment of the same. Um, I've reviewed the the pleadings that the party submitted, and I'm ready to hear argument from from the parties. Mr. Swenson, thank you, Your Honor. For the record, Stephen Swenson for the petitioner Tracy Driver. Um, as the court's aware, this was a separation that was recently converted to a divorce. Um, the separation was finalized legally in May of last year, um, and the respondent was ordered to pay $300 per month in spousal support, and then also to take care of her own debts. Um, the parties, as is often the case of separations, didn't cleanly split at that point. Um, it appears that Ms. Osborne was still depositing one monthly check into the account each month, um, but around April of this year, um, she stopped doing that, or no, April was the last time she deposited a check in the account. Um, and then on May 15th, if you look at the um, bank statements that we submitted, I know there's 45 pages of them, but on page 42, there is a deposit of $4,300. On May 15th for my client, um, she had sold a trailer that was solely in her name that she used inheritance money to buy. Um, and then she quickly paid off the cards, um, the Lowe's and the Honda debt. Um, on May 17th, she filed a protection order against Ms. Osborne and Ms. Osborne was removed from the home and they were financially split completely at that point. Um, Ms. Osborne has made no payments since then. Um, I know Ms. Osborne argues that she was out her whole April check, but um, Ms. Osborne throughout the relationship had complete control over the account. She still had account cards through May. Um, and so we would ask that um, she be ordered to pay back the money that was that paid off the cards and the in May, and then also three hundred dollars per month, starting on uh, June of this year to now. Thank you, Mr. Swanson. Is the is the request for the the, the full amount of the original debt as listed? You know, the twenty nine hundred for the Honda, sixteen hundred for Lowe's Capital One, nine hundred, or is it the lesser amount that was used to pay off from the trailer proceeds? I think it'd be the lesser for the trailer proceeds. Now that I've seen the bank accounts. Okay. All right. Okay. Very good. And then just one, one question for you, Mr. Swenson, the, the, your take on the May 26, 2022 order, it was uh, three months, pardon me, $300 of spousal support uh, starting in July of 2022 and ending of July of 2023. Is that your reading of that order? Sorry, I don't have that order in front of me right this second. Okay, maybe just uh, take, take a look at that um, and then we'll go from there and then you can chime in a bit later. Okay, thank you. Ms. Bliss? Thank you, Your Honor. For the record, I do represent Linda Osborne in this matter, the non-moving party. Uh, as contained in my client's responsive declaration, the parties continued to have a joint bank account uh, from the time the legal separation was ordered um, until uh, Ms. Driver filed for a protection order in May of 2023. My client outlines for the court how many deposits she continued to put into that account 
totaling over $41,000 over that time frame. Uh, at this point, my client is asking the court to consider her spousal support obligation fully satisfied uh, and then some given those uh, continued deposits. Uh, my client disagrees with Ms. Driver's characterization of uh, the bank account and who primarily um, controlled the account. Uh, frankly, looking at Ms. Driver's bank statements, you see in April of 2023, my client's name was unilaterally removed from that bank account. So to simply suggest that my client had complete and utter control over this bank account uh, simply uh, is disproven by at least the bank statements provided by Ms. Driver. Ms. Driver's initial motion asked for $4,500 in spousal support to be ordered, uh, completely disregarding uh, the fact that the parties had a joint bank account, that my client was continuing to deposit her $4,000 uh, uh, paycheck per month in that bank account, uh, simply to mislead this court. And I asked the court, uh, my client asked the court in her uh, responsive declaration to consider uh, the potential perjury of Ms. Driver uh, and to consider sanctions uh, accordingly, because this, this motion largely is inappropriate uh, before the court. Uh, looking at the text messages provided by Ms. Driver um, in her reply declaration largely supports my client's claims in her responsive declaration uh, regarding the uh, joint debts. The parties came to an agreement as to paying off the debts. Uh, again, my client disagrees with the characterization of the trailer. If your honor does look at that final separation uh, decree, there was no assets listed. Uh, my client believes that was a community asset that the parties agreed to sell, uh, as she contained in her declaration. And with those proceeds, the parties agreed to pay off the joint debt. So for Ms. Driver to bring a motion before the court, uh, simply stating my client paid zero spousal support for over a year, uh, when clearly the records show uh, the contrary, and that my client failed to pay any of the debts throughout the lifetime of the case, also fails uh, to, prove, to be proven. Again, going through Ms. Driver's uh, bank statement provided to the court, every single month there was a deposit by my client. Every single month there was a payment to the Lowe's account. There was a payment to the uh, Honda. Uh, and likely, uh, more often than not, there was a payment to the Capital One. I did see a couple months where there wasn't payments, double payments the next. Um, so my client was in compliance with the legal separation order, and that is that is confirmed by Ms. Driver's own pleadings. Um, so we are asking the court to deny Ms. Driver's motion before the court today, order sanctions uh, for for the, for the clear perjury in her initial motion, uh, and we are asking for an award of attorney's fees. So is it, thank you, Ms. Bliss, is it Ms. Osborne's position that the payoff of the debt, the, the remaining debt um, by Ms. Driver, uh, that was, that was a, a that your, her position is that, that was a joint decision and that's what the parties had kind of planned on because your client had been making those payments over a period of, of months and then, um, so that's that's her position, right? Correct, Your Honor. It was my client's understanding that the parties had agreed to sell sale the trailer uh, and with those proceeds to pay off the community debts so that there were no longer monthly payments. Okay. All right. Thank you for that clarification. All right. Mr. Swenson. Thank you, Your Honor. And yes, I reviewed the uh, decree of dissolution from uh, May of 2024. And it's my understanding that the spousal support was to go through July of 2024. Yeah. Oh, 2024. Yeah, that's what the degree of dissolution says, 2024. Key difference. Thank you. I appreciate yes. you looking at that. And let me just pull um, again. go ahead, go ahead and speak. I'm just going to pull that up and take a quick look. And at it. I'll just state that um, there was a lot of abuse in this relationship, as the text messages show. Um, my client was threatened with release of medical history if she didn't pay off Miss Osborne's credit card. Um, so I don't think any agreement to use my client's money was um, really made without duress. Um, and the ongoing three hundred dollars per month, it, it's it's still going, and she hasn't paid. Even if they did not separate until um, five months ago, the five months have gone by with no spousal support. Because um, let me ask, as far as the the sale of the trailer, uh, Ms. Ms. Bliss, was there anything in the pleadings that showed, hey, here's a receipt for the sale of the the, the trailer, and this is that this is the source of that forty five hundred dollars or forty four thousand dollars? Either either party could answer, if you know. Not that I recall, I do uh, I do remember that Ms. Driver's reply declaration had indicated that she had sold the trailer, that she, it was at that point that she believed that that was her uh, separate property. Obviously, my client didn't have the opportunity to respond to that, but that was my client's initial reaction upon receiving that document from Ms. Driver. Thanks. Mr. Swanson? And I believe the trailer was sold for cash, and that's why there's a cash deposit of $4,300 on May 15th. Um, I'd also like to point out that um, Ms. Osborne claims that she paid um, may rent, but we showed that Calus Tribe actually paid that money and my client paid um, the rent with that. All right, thank you. Okay, so we're look, I'm, I'm looking at the, the May 2022 uh, decree, which requires a payment of three, $300 per month. 
um, from starting July of 2022 through July of 2024 to, to be received on the 10th of each month. Uh, so Ms. Ms. Driver indicates that she's uh, she's never received those monies. Ms. Osborne indicates that her joint uh, the joint bank account was the receptacle or recipient of her 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 her, her pay stub her income. Uh, what what I'm not seeing is a, a direct three hundred dollar payment. Uh, there's allegations that there's control issues with the the, the money and the like. Uh, but what I'm not seeing is um, in the bank records uh, a three hundred dollar you know, maybe moving the $300 from that joint account to a separate account or cash withdrawals of $300, something that signifies to me that there's compliance with that with that order. A, a simple deposit in, in into a joint account uh, that allows all parties to use the money, uh, at least to my mind, doesn't suffice as, as a showing of spousal support. Um, so I'll make a finding that there's been a failure to make spousal support for the, the, the length of, uh, from July of 2022 to current, I think as, as of the pleading date. Uh, so that that amount, I think that was calculated by Mr. Swenson to be around forty five hundred dollars. Um, so uh, I'll, I'll award that as that. So I'll make a finding of contempt for that that there was not a specific effort to to pay that precise dollar amount. Um, as far as the the, the debts, that's a, a little bit more murky in my mind. Um, in that there were were joint funds uh, going to pay pay these pay these debts, and that there's some question as to the trailer where, of its characterization, whether it's separate or whether it's community and uh, whether those funds were uh, received from that. They could be, I'm not exactly sure. Uh, and that the then thereafter, there was a, either an alley, a joint decision to, to pay off the remaining debt or uh, or not. So I, I, I'm not gonna make a finding of, of contempt on that. I think that's a, that, that the burden has not been satisfied to, to, to carry the day to show that, that's, that there was contemptuous behavior there. Um, so, uh, so with no explanation of why there's there's that there's a direct pay and payment of the spousal support, I'll make that finding of contempt. I'll impose a, a one hundred dollars civil civil sanction for that contempt. And okay, so that, that's where we're at. Uh, so, any party have any question or clarification requested? So I understand your honor's ruling that there wasn't a specific $300 a month payment. Are you giving my client any credit for the monies that she did deposit into the account? I don't know what amount that would be. So it's that's unknown to me as far as, you know, there's a commingling of funds, obviously, but what that am amounts to and who gets what and how much, I, it's really kind of a mystery to me at this, at this early stage. Okay. Uh, any other questions or clarifications? Um, should we set a presentation date for an order? Probably a good idea. Let's go ahead and take a look at calendars. Um, 31st of October. Uh, how does that look for a presentation? Is the moving 9 a.m. I we'll hear that. from Mr. Bamer. Ms. Bliss. Thank you, Your Honor. Megan Gilmore on behalf of the respondent moving party, namely Crystal Kelly. And while my client was a pro se litigant, she apprehensively agreed to a 50 50 residential schedule in 2022 for the party's now 13 year old daughter, Hadley. As explained with my client's declaration and exhibits, father has a lengthy history of alcoholism, including four convictions for DUIs. Um, the child's mental health records really speak for themselves, so I won't go too much into to that. However, um, those records really illustrate the struggles this child's having at her father's home, her declining mental health, including self attempts at self-harm. Um, and it's really the nexus of this is father's ongoing substance abuse and the attached um, domestic violence that occurs due to overconsumption of alcohol. Um, father goes as far as telling this child that she should kill herself when he's intoxicated. And this is already an extremely fa fragile child. Um, this child is so scared that she's calling law enforcement while in father's home, begging my client to pick her up. Father's acknowledging this behavior has historically been inappropriate, has acquiesced to not having visitation over the summer. Um, when visitation re was reestablished in August, um, he immediately went back to drinking and the, the issues have um, started again. Um, the very the current parenting plan is very much not in this child's best interest. Um, again, as it's my understanding, father continues to abuse alcohol on a daily basis while the child's again mental health continues to decline. I'm happy to provide the court with some additional mental health records. We simply didn't receive a response, so there was nothing really to reply to here, but I'm happy to provide whatever I need to. Um, my client doesn't want to cut off visitation. She does acknowledge that father has had a robust schedule for the last year. However, any visitation must be contingent on him, absolutely not um, drinking whatsoever seeking a, a, a substance abuse evaluation and complying with all forms of treatment. Um, and we do ask the court um, 
propose or grant our proposal regarding the parenting plan. I can go into child support. He didn't provide any responsive pleadings. So I don't think we necessarily need to dive into that at this point, but it's mainly focusing on the parenting plan. If the court is willing to set this matter over, I do have concerns. I obviously didn't volunteer that um, to set this over. I do appreciate the situation where I was surprised that his attorney did un unexpectedly get out of the case, um, but I, I didn't voluntarily set this over just because of my concerns regarding this child's mental health. So if the court is going to grant to set over, I would say that it's, I would ask that it's very um, in short order. I would ask that he provide that if he's actually retaining an attorney and when they would be able to get on the case and um, potentially consider appointing a guardian at light immediately. Okay. All right. Thank you. All right, Mr. Beamer, I, I recognize your request that you submitted uh, related to the withdrawal of your attorney and you're asking for a continuance. So I'll, I'll hear from you, please. Yes. I'm, I'm uh, seeking a continuance for legal uh, representation. And um, I do have a, a consultation with Eric, Eric, uh, Aaron Winkle today at 11 o'clock so hopefully she'll take the case i've called uh lots of lawyers um it seems like nobody can get me in for like a month and a half two months so i'm, I'm hoping aaron aaron will be able to take the case and that's all i got okay and so i'm i'm, I'm inclined to grant the continuance as, as as noted by or requested by mr mr Bamer. Um, I just want to ask Mr. Bamer if he has any positions. There was a request by by Ms. Um, Gilmore related to alcohol consumption during uh, the, uh, your parenting time. Do you have any any input on that? I I don't consume any alcohol while my while I'm around my daughter. So, and I've actually um, not going to. So that's all I can say. Um, you could you know, I'm not really thinking I have a problem. So. Um, I hope that, you know, we can, you know, that's all I got, so. Okay, all right, thank you. Um, so, Mr. Baber, your request is to set it over three weeks. I think that's what you said in your pleadings. Three, three, three to four weeks. I'm hoping, you know, Aaron will take it. If not, then I'm not, you know, it's, I don't know why. It, uh, everybody says they're like a month and a half out, two months out on, on um, consultations, so. Yeah, okay, thank you. Ms. Gilmore, any, any, any follow-up? I'm concerned by his acknowledgement that he doesn't have a problem with alcohol, which often results in him, you know, again, consuming during visitation. Uh, I would ask that there is a prohibition on the alcohol consumption, potentially ask the court to order some sort of um, drug testing so we have some sort of baseline. And again, uh, just appoint a guardian at light, and especially if we're setting this over three weeks, there is a possibility that they would get some information and shown. And I'm happy to provide the court with some more mental health records. Okay. All right. Thank you. And, and Mr. Beamer, what's your position related to the appointment of a, a guardian ad, ad litem to uh, kind of be eyes and ears for the court and report back? So what, what's, what is, what's your question? Yeah, uh, so Ms. Gilmore had asked for an appointment of a guardian ad litem. Uh, guardian ad litem, their job is to advocate uh, basically the best interest of the child and, and bring forth information to the court uh, after speaking to you, the other party, other interested individuals who may have relevant information about the, the child's well-being. So they do an investigation. Um, sometimes there are quick turnaround times, other times they are more lengthy investigation. And they uh, they basically they, they investigate what's gonna be in the, the best interest of the child, basically investigate your concerns, investigate the mother's concerns and report back to the court. So that's, and the, the process in which that has, we have a registry of individuals who serve as guardians ad litem. And then if uh, we were to do that today, I would present three names, the next three people on the list. Each party uh, has the right to strike one of those uh, potential guardians ad litem. And then if both of you strike one individual, uh, that whoever's remaining remaining standing would be the, the appointed guardian ad litem. Otherwise, we just go, if nobody uh, has any strikes, then we just go with the first person uh, on the list. Uh, there's also uh, related to guardians ad litem, uh, there's costs associated with that, either if a, a party's not in a position to afford that um, and they're an, an, an indigent, an indigent uh, status or level, then the county picks up uh, their portion of the, the fee. Otherwise, it's what we call private pay, and then each party uh, pays uh, a rough percentage of the difference of the incomes between each party. You know, Say somebody earns 55% compared to 45% of the other party's income, then that would probably be the income requirements or the, the level of uh, cost responsibility for the guardian ad litem payment. So I've explained that a little bit. Do you have any questions on that? Anyway, and get some legal representation first or? Yeah, I'm granting the continuance, um, but 
the the request from Ms. Gilmore was that she wanted to do this, have the appointment earlier, which would then allow for the guardian ad litem to chime in, hope, hopefully at the, the next uh, hearing, which would either be the 7th of November or, or uh, October 31st. So, yeah, so I understand where you're coming. It sounds like you would like to consult with an attorney before making that decision. Is that is that your position? That'd be a, I, mean, I think that'd be a good thing from, you know, I'm not really, okay. um, I'd like that if I could. Okay. All right. Well, um, I'll, I'll grant the continuance. I think based on the the, the 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 withdrawal kind of of the former attorney, which was effective on the thirtieth of September, um, I will grant that continuance. Uh, let's go ahead and set it over to the seventh of November. Between now and the seventh of no November, I'm, I'm not making any changes in the parenting plan, but I think there's enough of concern raised through the mental health records and also uh, conviction data related to DUIs that I am going to impose an absolute prohibition of any alcohol consumption during Mr. Bamer's residential time with the child. And that includes eight hours prior to the, prior to the residential time uh, speak, or starting. And I'm also going to uh, allow um, Ms. Kelly to prepay for an alcohol test um, and that she would give notice to Mr. Bamer and within four hours of receiving that uh, notice that he needs to take that alcohol test, he would need to take it. If the test comes back as being positive, Mr. Bamer would need to reimburse Ms. Kelly for the cost of that test. Um, and if the test is positive, then the residential time ends at that time. The child goes to the, to the mother until our next hearing on November 7th. So it's an absolute prohibition on any alcohol consumption during Mr. Bamer's time, residential time, scheduled res residential time with the child. I'll hold off on the guardian ad litem appointment until we're here on the 7th. Uh, that'll allow Mr. Bamer to have access to an attorney and, and receive counsel. So Mr. Bamer, do you have any questions about that prohibition on alcohol consumption during your residential time? No, sir. Okay. All right, very good. All right, so we'll see everybody on, on November 7th at a.m. for continuation of this hearing. Ms. Gilmer, about, go ahead. Sorry. Um, since it's about a month, does the court want me to circulate just a quick order on hearing on the prohibition and the drug testing? Yeah, I think that would be appropriate. So, Mr. Beamer, what Ms. Gilmore is talking about is that I just issued a ruling related to the, the prohibition on alcohol consumption and the, the alcohol testing. Uh, she's going to put that into writing, and she's going to circulate it to you and to me. And then if I, I feel that it's appropriate and it captures what I ordered here today, then I'll sign off on that order and then I'll distribute copies to, to, to Mr. Bamer and to Ms. Gilmore and also file a copy with that has a name court similar. Court. Um, well, it looks like he's not here. So Ms. Bliss, this is your motion related to um, a appointment of special master and to assist with uh, the quick claim deed and the real estate excise affidavit. Um, so, and that's based on the July 2023 divorce decree that requires a signature from Mr. Hinton. Okay. Anything else you want to uh, say related to your motion? Uh, no, Your Honor. Mr. Hinton was to sign off on that um, quick claim deed and real estate tax uh, affidavit. My client uh, has been attempting to um, find him. Uh, he's essentially gone rogue at this point. Uh, my client is attempting to refinance the home, uh, so she does need that signed. Uh, so at this point, given his uh, failure to respond, failure to attend, um, I will ask that a special master be appointed to sign that on his behalf. Okay. And I'll, I'll just note for the record on July 10th, Mr. Hinton submitted a notice of change of address to the court and the court only not to, to uh, Ms. Craven that changed it to that Yakult address. And on September 14th, uh, Ms. Craven through Ms. Bliss sent a, a note for the motion docket to Mr. Hinton at that particular address. And that was returned uh, as undeliverable or not here or something. Basically, they sent it back to Mrs. Ms. Bliss's office. Um, and so that's that's the latest address that we have from Mr. Hinton was um, submitted on July 10th. That's where he's told everybody, hey, this is where you can reach me. This is and that's his responsibility to make sure that 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 address remains updated and a good address. Um, so with him having told everybody that's the address, I want to receive notice for things with notice being given and he's not here. I will grant the motion and uh, grant the, rec the relief requested by Ms. by Ms. Craven. So that means that. Um, so if so, so if so, the request I think was that if Mr. Hinton fails to sign the quick claim deed and the real estate tax affidavit, uh, that we would review it on the seventeenth of October, and if he's not here and it's not done, 
then a, the court would appoint a special master to sign both those documents on his behalf. Is that accurate? That was my initial request. I was also hoping that he would be present uh, so that we could entice him to sign. Uh, so at this point, I would ask that we just skip that first step and, and appoint a special master today uh, to save my client for having to pay for another appearance, which he is unlikely to attend. Okay. I, I'm fine with that. It, it, that seems like a, an unneeded extra step. So I agree with you on that. Um, so if you would like to submit a proposed order, I, I would ex parte, I would be happy to sign off on that. And if you could also send a copy of that same order to both the addresses that are on file, uh, the Yakult address and also the Castle Rock, the Missioner Street address, uh, just so there's so he knows what's happening if he if he cares to know. Um, and I'll also award $500 of attorney fees to be paid within 30 days. I will uh, revise that order. Did your honor want me to present a hard copy uh, for you to sign ex parte or email that over to you? Email's fine. Uh, Petri is listed today. as counsel and it looks like Mr. Sasaki is present. That's correct, Your Honor. And, and if I may begin, um, Ms. Petrie is, is ill this morning. Um, and so I'm, I was trying to um, appear on her behalf. I've been reviewing the pleadings and, and trying to um, get up to speed on everything. But uh, at this point, um, you know, apologizing to all the parties and opposing counsel, uh, don't feel, feel fully prepared um, to uh, represent um, for this hearing and, and respectfully ask, ask for uh, continuance. Okay, thank you, Mr. Sasaki. And Mr. Sasaki is here uh, representing Jordan Taylor. And I see Mr. Taylor is present. And can you hear me okay, Mr. Taylor? Yes, I can, Your Honor. Okay, very good. Welcome to you. And I see that Mr. Baldwin is here. He represents Mariah Taylor. And Ms. Taylor, can you hear me okay? Yes, I can. All right, very good. Welcome to you also. All right, so Mr. Baldwin, we heard from Mr. Sasaki here just a moment ago related to Ms. Petrie. Uh, do you have a position? Your Honor, given that, I I, I think it'd be in, in poor taste to object um, under the circumstances. The kids are still in school with my client um, locally, which is the issue that was raised in her initial declaration. I, I don't have any anticipation that's going to change until the court hears it. So uh, with that being the understanding of all parties, I think we can set it over. I heard Your Honor say you're out next week since you've already reviewed and prepared for the hearing. I'm fine with two weeks so Your Honor can hear the matter. Yeah, and then the, the, that two weeks, I'm, I'm also absent. So oh. yeah, so I would I, I think what I'd like to do uh, just since all the pleadings have been submitted, um, a judge can review those. We can set it to next week, and hopefully Ms. Petrie is, is feeling better, and, and everybody can argue their case fully. So, that's fine. Okay. Ms., Mr., that's okay with Mr. Baldwin, Mr. Sasaki? Yes, that should work. Thank you. Okay. Um, so let's, we'll set the case over uh, one one week to October 17th at 9 a.m. I appreciate the party's patience, and we thank you again address There's next certainly no, no requirement for a party to be present. i just like to, to be thorough, and if they're here, we'll, we'll mark them down as present. Uh, this is Ms. Uh, Harris's motion related to temporary orders. There was also, uh, I think we're on today for presentation uh, from a hearing uh, related to a prior hearing. Um, so we're talking about uh, child support, spousal support, attorney fees, and the like. So I've reviewed the pleadings from the parties. Um, I'll, if uh, Since the moving party is Ms. Dow, I would hear from her first, and then I'd hear from Ms. Mr. Harris thereafter. So we'll turn the time to Ms. Dow, please. Uh, so, Your Honor, are we going to take all three of them as a group since they're substantially related? That's my hope. I think it, that that's probably okay. as easy as anything. Okay, well, <clears throat> uh, to the straightforward one first, the presentation of the temporary family law order from mm -hmm. the hearing that was held on September 22nd, I believe, or sorry, September 12th. Um, mm -hmm. I just received Mr. Harris's proposed order yesterday. Okay. Um it, the, the construction is not correct, but the content is substantially as the court ordered. So I don't really have an objection to the content. I'm mm -hmm. not sure what the court wants to do about the way the order is constructed. Um, Are you talking, talking kind of formatting? and Yes, yes. The, the order is all up in the findings. Oh, okay. Okay. And then, Mr. Harris, did you, as far as that proposed order, it sounds like you, you forwarded that to Ms. Dow for her review. And then did you forward a copy to the court for its review? I believe I did. Okay. So if, if you did, it hasn't made its way to me yet. Um, and let me just double check again. You know, I, I looked at it last night, so sometimes things pop up overnight. So let me just double check to see if it may have hit the file. Yeah, it looks like as far as that proposed order, I, I have not yet received it. Um, so we probably, what if we could do, we can, we could set the case over for a, a period of time 
So I could look at the proposed order and maybe the two of you could maybe look at the proposed order if there's any, sounds like the substance of it is probably okay. And maybe it's just the formatting and, and the, which is important. It may seem like it's not terribly important, but uh, where things go and how it's said are, are, are important. So any concerns if we were to set that piece of today's hearing over for a period of time so we could take a fresh look at us with everybody seeing it? I don't have any opposition. And I don't have any objection, Your Honor. And if Mr. Harris would like, um, I can just explain to him what, what was wrong with the uh, with the formatting and the construction of the order. Um, as I said, the, the content is correct. Okay. Yeah, and generally that's the way it works. Uh, the, the party that uh, drafts the order submits it to the other party. If the party other party has any concerns, they express that to the other party, and, and oftentimes they can work out those issues, and then they present an order that everybody's happy with, and I sign off on it. If, if everybody's not happy, then you present with to me your concerns and the pr proposed order, and then on the date of the hearing, which uh, I would make a decision on on the final 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 order. So let's set the uh, the presentation over to December. Pardon me, October October thirty first at 9 a.m. Does, does that uh, work for everyone's schedule? Mr. Harris, how does that look for your schedule? I can make it work. Very good. Thank and you. That works for mine, Your Honor. Um, and Thank I'll just say that uh, currently the car the parties are uh, following the schedule that the court uh, ordered at the hearing. Um, so I, I think we're good on the continuance and we'll get that order straightened out. Okay. That sounds great. Thank you. Okay, so um, the Mr. Harris's motion for child support, temporary child support, and our motion for temporary spousal maintenance, um, they both turn on the relative financial positions of the parties, as well as the obligation to pay child support. Um, they both submitted their financial documents and their worksheets. Um, we are objecting on the record to Mr. Harris using the support worksheets as a vehicle for his arguments in this matter, and we're asking the court not to consider uh, any of his statements on pages uh, four and five, section 26 of the worksheet. Um, they're inappropriate for that document. Um, we're also asking the court to take note that in his calculations, Mr. Harris neglected to include the calculations for low income limitations, specifically item C. Um, our worksheet- That's the self-reserve self or self Yes, yes, reserve. those are the calculations surrounding the self-support reserve. Um, okay. Our worksheet properly takes low income limitations into account and it calculates Ms. Harris's child support obligation at just over the presumptive $50 per child um, at, I believe it's $110.99. Um, so we are uh, asking the court to adopt our worksheet. Um, my client doesn't deny her obligation to support their children, but even the $110 a month is going to further reduce her resources um, in, in order to find a place to live. Um, she does; she still doesn't have a safe place to live. Um, and that brings us to the issue of spousal maintenance. Um, there's no question here that either party is well off or that they have substantial income. Um, as I said, the court has financial income for both parties. Um, this is a 20 year relationship. Um, the parties were together since 2002, even though they didn't formally marry until 2010. Uh, my client was a full time homemaker for the past 13 years. She's just now returning to the workforce with no current work experience and a degree that <clears throat> appears to be somewhat less worthy in terms of employment than the debt she actually owes on it. It was an online degree and her response from local employers has been um, unenthusiastic to say the least. Uh, Ms. Dow, can she, I ask you a question? The bachelor's degree, do you know what, what filled a study? It Did was it? in a medical office management, I believe. Um, my client, uh, the information that she has shared with me, I think my client may have been taken advantage of. Um, however, that's neither here nor there. Uh, it's not a, a resume that has uh, helped her find alternate work. And the fact remains, she still hasn't been working for the last 13 years. So she has no current experience in a field that changes quite rapidly. Um, 
the job she's working at is one that she was uh, uh, able to find locally, so she doesn't have to drive a lot. She drives a very old uh, gas guzzling truck. Um, she is here in Longview area. She makes $16 an hour, and her schedule has her uh, at 30 hours a week. It's 59 and a half hours every two weeks. It's a rolling schedule, so her schedule changes every couple of weeks, um, but that's what she earns. We've submitted those documents for the court to review. Um, she absolutely denies Mr. Harris's allegations of any romantic relationships um, or any external support uh, sources of support. Those are not relevant to this argument, but it's money that she does not have that he thinks she is receiving, or at least he's claiming he thinks she's receiving. Um, Mr. Harris is the one who's remaining in what's been the family home for several years. He and the children have an ongoing place to live. They have everything that a household needs. Um, he earns twice what she does, even though it's not a lot, it's still twice what she does. Um, she's sleeping on an air mattress in her brother's home office at the moment because she doesn't have anywhere else to go. Um, that's a temporary situation at best. Her circle of acquaintances uh, as a pool for potential roommates, as Mr. Harris is suggesting, is very limited due to her isolation during the last years of their marriage. Um, if she's to find even minimal housing in this area, uh, she needs spousal support, and Mr. Harris is in the position to pay it. Um, we're asking the court to grant our request for $1,000 a month in maintenance, at least temporarily so that Ms. Harris can get into a place um, where she can pay rent. At this point in time, most landlords in the area are asking for uh, proof of income three times the amount uh, of what the monthly rental is, which makes getting in on the front end nearly impossible for her. Even if she can pay the rent on a monthly basis, she doesn't have the funds to get into a rental. So we're asking that the court grant our request for spousal maintenance. Um, and at this point, we're asking the court, uh, we're taking the somewhat unusual step of asking the court to reserve on our request for attorney fees, as well as Mr. Harris's request for attorney fees um, until the parties get their finances a little bit better separated and sorted out so that we can see what they actually have. Um, at the moment, my client has nothing. She has nothing beyond what she earns. Um, so we're asking the court not to dismiss that, but rather to reserve on the issue. Thank you. Okay. All right. Thank you. Mr. Harris. Yes. I'll, I'll hear from you and hear your argument, please. Well, I would like to object to the claims of me making double what she actually makes. Um, you've seen my financial records, I, I'm sure. Um, you're aware of you know what I make on a monthly basis and my main focus is the children and most of my finances go to their needs. Um, what's your take on, I, uh, maybe I can ask you a quick question. Uh, what's yes. your take, take on Ms. Dow's argument related to what's called the self-support reserve, uh, which is basically a, a standard that says, hey, if a certain party is earning at, at a certain low level of income, that their child support should necessarily be lower uh, to allow for self-support. Um, I have no objection to that. I mean, I, I understand that. Okay. I, I may have incorrectly filled out the sheet as I'm not real familiar with these types of documents. Sure. Okay. Thanks. Feel free and, and, and share, share your thoughts and arguments related to your position. Well, I'd, uh, I'd like to point out, uh, that, you know, reading through her financial declaration, uh, I, I understand she has been living off of credit cards and I'm not entirely sure how she would have obtained most of that without potentially using my income as also a source because we are still legally married. Um, she could use my credit information to obtain those cards. Um, you know, I mean, I, I understand neither of us really make a lot of money. Um, I'm not arguing that point whatsoever. Um, but her overinflation of her expenses is disturbing. I, I don't think I have anything else. Okay. And you had indicated that you were interested in attorney fees and also mental health and substance use disorder evaluations. And then what's your position on those? Um, yeah, I, I'm standing by my pleading, Your Honor. Okay. All right. Thank you. Okay. Ms. Dell? Um, Your Honor, the court has already ruled on the issue of substance abuse. Um, the court entered, uh, sorry, the, the, the court 
gave us an order. It hasn't been entered yet, but the court gave us an order that if Mr. Harris is concerned about substance abuse issues, that he make arrangements for a hair follicle test. He pay for it in advance. And if he makes such arrangements and notifies my client, she has 72 hours to comply. And that if uh, the tests come back negative, uh, Mr. Harris pays for the test. If they come back positive, um, then she will pay for the test and will revisit the issue of supervised visitation. Mr. Harris hasn't done anything on that front. Um, as far as the request for uh, uh, mental health evaluations, I don't believe that is properly before the court today. Um, that was an issue that was raised uh, for the original hearing on the motion for temporary orders that was held on the 12th of September, and the court did not rule on that. Uh, my client is in counseling. Um, she is, she's not suffering from any mental health issues that are any different than anybody else in this situation would be. Um, and they don't affect her ability to parent the children. Um, they may affect her ability to get along with Mr. Harris and her mother, but that's not before the court. Okay. All right. Thank you. And so, in, so as far as the SUD, the hair follicle uh, arrangement that you mentioned, Ms. Dow, that, that, that originated and the court made a ruling on that you know, on September 12th, and we just haven't uh, put it into finalized order at this point, correct? That's correct. And what the court said at the time was that Mr. Harris may request such a test. He hasn't done so. Okay. Is that your understanding, Mr. Harris? Yes. Okay. All right. Very good. Okay, so as far as the, the here, there's uh, motions related to child support, spousal support, and a request for attorney fees. Uh, I, I think it's fairly clear from the, the pleadings, uh, both uh, both Mr. Harris and Ms. Harris are, are hourly wage earners, and so their, their incomes are fairly straightforward in that there's withholding and FICA and other things that are taken out uh, from that hourly wage, and get, so we have a gross and we have a net. I think it's fairly clear that the uh, Mr. Harris earns $20.57 57 per hour, which sets his net at about 2,600 after you know taxes and other things are taken out. I think uh, Ms. Harris's uh, net income is also fairly easily attainable in that uh, she earns, I think it's 16 plus dollars an hour. She works 30 hours a week. And so it looks like her income's at 1650, or her net income is at 1650 per, per month. So those are the, the figures I'm gonna use for the child support. Uh, father, Mr. Harris at 2,600 per month net, Ms. Harris, mother at 1,650 per month. And that would be used to put into those child support worksheets. And then the child support reserve uh, is gonna probably be around the 110 month $110 per month. It may be slightly higher or slightly lower because I use my figures are slightly different than those that Ms. Dow and Mr. Harris used. Uh, but it's going to be in that general time frame. So that'll be the child support that's required that Ms. Harris pay to Mr. Harris for the support of the children. So your honor, if I may clarify here, does that mean you're going to adopt our worksheet at 110, uh, $111.99 a month? It's 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 in the uh, it's in the ballpark. So let me just look. So your proposed sets Ms. Harris at one thousand six hundred thirty, and I had her set at one thousand six hundred fifty. So nominal difference. And then I had Mr. Harris set at two thousand six hundred, and you had him set at two thousand six hundred fifty. Uh, so yeah, so th the proposed worksheets there. Um, I don't have any issues with them other than just those numbers that are slightly off, differ by a very small amount. And that really translates to probably even a more minute change in that 111.99. So as far as the proposed orders, um, I'm fine with them just with a, a change to the, the dollar figures. So instead of the 1630 for Ms. Harris, it should be 1650. And instead of 2652 for Mr. Harris, it should be 2600 even. So we'll uh, draft a new worksheet and, um, well, I believe this is Mr. Harris's motion. Um, I can work with Mr. Harris on getting a new worksheet drafted and an actual support order drafted. That would be fantastic. And we can just set it for presentation on the 31st along with the, uh, the prior order. Okay. And then as far as the, the request for spousal support, so what we know is that the parties have been together for an extended period of time. Their, their marriage uh, since date of marriage till now has been about 13 years of, of marriage, roughly. Um, and that during that time frame, 
uh, Mr. Harris was uh, the uh, breadwinner, breadwinner and Ms. Harris was taking care of the, the, the family and the children. The, what we know, do know is that money is in short supply. The cost of living is, is high. Rent, rents are high. Food is expensive. Uh, the costs are, have increased dramatically in the past year or two. Uh, so money is tight. Uh, so um, Ms. Harris has a, a four-year or has a bachelor's degree. Mr. Harris points out he has his uh, uh, equivalency degree diploma, uh, and that while she makes um, he makes a few dollars more per hour than she, uh, he posits that her income earning level potential is is higher because of that bachelor's degree. Um, so, you know, all bachelor's degrees are, are not created equal. However, it is a bachelor's degree. It counts for something. Uh, some employers have a, a minimum cutoff. You have to have a bachelor's and she she has that criteria at least. Um, so at six, one thing to consider also is that she's working 30 hours per week as opposed to 40 hours per week. Uh, at, and she's just slightly above the minimum minimum wage. And I know there's other other jobs where potentially she could earn greater income and work more hours. Uh, so there's a sense that she's slightly underemployed. Um, and so that's one consideration I have also. As far as attorney fees, let me just pause on the spousal support and just pivot to the attorney fees. As far as the attorney fees, uh, I'm going to deny requests from, from either from both parties for any attorney fees at this point. Um, I, I think both parties are monies are short and they're doing the best they can. Uh, so I'll hold off on that. I'll, I will reserve it if there's a, a change in income or something that uh, the parties feel is different than what's been presented, then they could certainly, we could revisit it. The, uh, the issue of spousal support has to take a look at a couple of things. One, we look at the need of the individual who's requesting it. I think Ms. Harris has demonstrated that, that need uh, by her current living situation where there's not enough money to get into housing. Um, so we look at that, and then we also look at the resources of the individual who's been requested to pay spousal support. So Mr. Harris uh, has about $2,600 a month of, of disposable income, with a lot of that going to rent and other, other items. So, yeah, so there's not a lot of excess. Uh, so I, I think what I'm going to do, I'm going to set the uh, spousal support at $250 uh, per month. And if you want to take a, you know, it, it's basically it's a it's a, a net, in, net transfer of, you know, you take the 250 subtract the roughly 111. So it comes out to about a $140 transfer that would go towards towards Ms. Harris. But but I'll make that funny as far as spousal support. I think there is a need. I think there is a slight amount of ability of Mr. Harris to pay the 250 and Ms. Harris would be paying the 110. So the net amount is one a transfer of 140. Um, but I think that keeping them separate is, is important too. So that, that'll be the court's order. And as far as a start date, uh, today's August or October 10th. I think we should we should start that on October fifteenth, and the fifteenth of each month thereafter. That'll, that'll apply for the child support, and that'll apply for the, the spousal support. Thank you, Your Honor. Um, if we have to divide up the child support to work with my client's pay cycle, uh, mm -hmm. would the court permit that? Yeah, I'm, I'm sensitive to that because having those having those um, payments going out near the payment receipt or when you get your wages, uh, I think is important. So if it needs to be say on like the, the 5th and the 20th, I'm okay moving that that October 15th start date to October 20th, if that's more in line with the, the pay periods. Mr. Harris, what's your, what's your pay schedule? How many times a month are you paid? Uh, I get paid every two weeks and it rotates from month to month. Okay. So is it generally at the, the 5th and the 20th in, the, in that range? Yeah. Okay. All right, so let, let's set then at the the, the 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 payments can be divided up into, into two per month. So it would be on the on or about the fifth or the twentieth of each month, and we'll we'll start on the twentieth of this month. Thank you, Your Honor. All right, and so then we will set that issue to the same presentation docket on October thirty first at nine a.m. So I appreciate the parties working together as far as getting those orders prepared and reviewed from from each, and then we'll be here on the thirty first. Ms. Nelson, is All right. on the line. Thank Ms. You, Nelson, Honor. can you hear me? Oh, okay, great. Thank you. Yes, Thank I can. You, Your Honor. All right, very good. Welcome to you. And I see that Mr. Daly is on the line. Mr. Daly, can you hear me? Yes, I can. Okay, welcome to you. And are, Mr. Daly, are you expecting Mr. Brungart to be present today? Yes. Have you had, heard any word from him? At, uh, if he's on his way, if he's been delayed? He is on his way. He could be to another court. Okay. All right. Um, so at this point, uh, your matter is the, the final matter on my docket. So what I'd like to do is just take a, a brief recess.
And let's reconvene in about 10 minutes at 10.15. And we'll hope that Mr. Um, Brungard is here at that time. Otherwise, maybe in between, Mr. Daly, you could get a, a status update from him to see if he'll be here at 10.15. And you can share that information with us at when we reconvene at 10.15. Here on a motion uh, brought by Mr. Daly or related to uh, the parenting of the small child. So I've, I've read the uh, of requests uh, by submitted by both parties in your in your pleading. So I'll hear from Mr. Brungart first as the moving party, and then I'll turn the time to Ms. Nelson to hear your position and, and your thoughts. So Mr. Brungart. Uh, Judge, yes, I'm going to stand by the pleadings I have filed, but unfortunately, even though the your honor cautioned the respondent about making sure I receive pleadings, I have not received any pleadings by email, mail, or personal service, and so I have no idea of what has been filed in this case. Hmm. Okay, let me let me touch base with Ms. Nelson. Ms. Nelson, as far as, uh, do you have any thoughts about Mr. Brungar's uh, comments? Yes, I have been trying to get it to him, but I don't know exactly what's going on with my phone. I have it scanned into my phone, um, but for some reason, my email is not working. I have tried to fax it over to him from work, uh, the work printer I have at my job, and the printer wasn't allowing me to. Um, I'm a single full-time mom, so I, on my days off, am with my daughter all day long, um, meeting with the emergency support shelter, um, trying to figure out a lawyer to support me on my part. Okay, so with you mentioned the, you know, you, it sounds like you scanned the, your your documents that you had filed with the court. Did you have you tried to print them out and, and mail them to Mr. Brungard? I have them printed out. Um, I wasn't sure because I do have a yellow envelope that I can put them in. I wasn't sure if I am supposed to take them to the post office or if I'm supposed to just hand them over to the mail lady here at my house and then have her. Yeah, you'd, you'd likely have to uh, put them in the, the envelope, take it to the post office, weigh it, find out what, how much the postage is going to cost, put the postage on there, and then uh, send it off then to, to Mr. Brungart's office. And then you'd have to take a second step of doing what's called an affidavit or a certificate of service, where you just mm -hmm. say, hey, on such and such a date, I deposited this envelope that contained these documents in them, then you list off the documents, and I sent it off to Mr. Brungart's uh, office at such and such address, and then you'd file that certificate okay. or affidavit. Okay. So, so okay. I do have them copied. I do have a copy for him. Um, I just have to get it over to him. Right. Okay. All right. Thank you. So let me touch, circle back to Mr. Brungart. Mr. Brungart, uh, knowing now it sounds like Ms. Ms. Nelson has a plan to get those documents to you. What is your uh, position related to having the hearing today? Do you want to proceed or do you want to wait until you get those documents from Ms. Nelson? Well, my client has been waiting a very long time uh, to have visitation with his baby. And so uh, I am going to uh, pursue uh, moving forward today. And then after receipt of those, if I believe it necessary to ask the court to, uh, to reconsider, um, I'm going to. But I would ask that we proceed today, Judge. Okay. Ms. Nelson, do you have any concerns if we were to proceed today and, and make a decision on, on the issues and then potentially come back and uh, take a different look at it after he's looked at your, your paperwork? Um, I don't see a problem with proceeding today, but I would like to have him have the paperwork first um, before even proceeding. That way he does have my part along with Roy's part. Okay. You know, I think as, as a general rule, my, my take on this is that the system works best when all parties have had their opportunity to chime in and every party has had an opportunity to read what that other party's saying and so that they can know exactly what their position is and be able to respond to it. Uh, it tends to be more efficient in that we wouldn't have to come back later on after we've addressed the issues and then, okay, now, well, now we've got this information that was kind of already here but wasn't considered fully and then kind of revisit a decision that we've already made. So that's that's one caution I have about uh, hearing it today and moving forward today. That's tempered also by, you know, Mr. What Mr. Brun Brungard said that his client is interested in uh, seeing seeing his child um, and has waited a long time. So I'm trying to I'm weighing those two competing 
competing balances or, or, or interests, pardon me. Um, let me check with Ms. Nielsen. As far as Ms. Nielsen, getting that uh, envelope shipped out uh, to Mr. Brunkert, how, th- how quickly do you think that would happen? I can have it to him this week. Okay, so you could get to the, the office, post office today and get that mailed out? Yes. Okay. All right. Um, your honor is not available. I, I don't believe your honor is available next Tuesday, the 17th, as I recall from earlier court hearings. Is that correct? Yeah, th- that is correct. The docket's still open. It'll still happen. Another judicial officer will be here. Um, I understand. So, so I think we could probably... Would your honor- Go ahead. Would you under, I'm sorry, I apologize. Oh, no, you're okay. You're okay. You don't get the benefit of seeing faces and movements and the like, so go ahead. Would you honor be available on the 31st? I am available that day, yes. I, I, I can feel my client cringe, but what I'm going to suggest is we do it on the 31st because even if I receive the material from the respondent today, I would still, I imagine, want to respond to any uh, any factual statements that she makes. And so that is going to mean that the 31st is probably the closest, most reasonable, uh, functional uh, date that, uh, that we have available. Thank you. Yeah, I tend to agree. I think that's, that, that's a reasonable approach, and I appreciate that suggestion. Ms. Nelson, October 31st, how does that look for your schedule for the, to hear this motion? Uh, that works for me. Okay. Well, I I appreciate the party's um, flexibility. Uh, Let's plan on that. October 31st at 9 a.m., Ms. Nielsen will get those documents shipped out to Mr. Brungart, and so he can review them with his client, and if he would like, and then he could uh, submit a a rebuttal or a reply brief, and so I'll have read that, and we can fully argue the issue on on the 31st. Okay. Any any questions from either party? No, Judge. No, Your Honor. Okay. No, sir. Very good. We'll reconvene October 31st at at 9 a.m. Thank you for your patience. All right. Thank Thank you. you.